How's it guys and welcome to the first episode of the Wild Food Revolution. The way I'm structuring these series of videos is going to be in a three part series. First we're going to learn about the ingredients, second we're going to learn how to prepare the ingredients, how to sustainably and responsibly forage them and then third we're going to get into the kitchen and start cooking. I think it's important we follow these steps that we're following through with breaking it up into three different series so that everybody gets a holistic and a good in-depth view of where your ingredient comes from, how to prepare it, how to harvest it sustainably and also how to prepare it and serve it to your customers. So through all the work that I've been doing, all the research about getting back and one thing I'm going to start doing is compiling a list of over 450 types of species of indigenous and edible foods in South Africa. You know, that also including the nutritional content. And I also want to showcase some comparisons between the current commercial crop versus indigenous foods to show you how much more healthy our food is. The next thing I want to do is create a cookbook of indigenous foods. And with this cookbook, it's going to be something very special because I want to embrace the heritage and culture of the region, how does the ingredients land on the shore, what is the story behind them, because I think it's always important to have that story to tell with the food that you sell. We move towards wild indigenous foods and ingredients use. It's mainly on the purpose of creating a regenerator for our young kids, you know, for our industry, but also exposing some of the ingredients that we actually have on our shores. One thing everybody has forgotten within this industry that South Africa has actually some of the best chefs in the world. Not only do we have the best chefs in the world, we have the best eco-terrorism destinations that one can find. You know, we have the whole world in one country. For thousands of years, you know, people looked at the land eating indigenous foods and living in symbiosis with nature. You know, allowing a season to recover from one season with being nomadic people when they were hunting and gathering. Us as humans, where we are today, we are going to be expanded. We have taken up more space than we're supposed to, and indigenous fauna and flora are struggling. Once the industry starts embracing indigenous and wild food propagation, we're going to see a huge transformation in job skills development as well, promoting our biodiversity, promoting ecotourism in South Africa, and being proud of the land that we come from and the ingredients that we have been showcasing. You know, South Africa is a land of forgotten foods and has become a land of forgotten foods based on the fact that our superstores and retailers have adjusted their markets and their buying styles according to immigration. You know, a study was conducted where 80% of local people said they would prefer to buy indigenous foods within the supermarkets, but it seems like those are one of those things that went on to deaf ears and nobody ever action. When you're looking at your retailers and they always say to you, sustainable, organic, do your homework, do your traceability. I always believe that when you are foraging and finding indigenous and wild foods, you know your source, you know your traceability, you know where the ingredient comes from, and you know the food is safe to eat. You know, a lot of things that we don't understand or know is that where our food comes from, what has been put into our food. So now's the time that we actually get down, get our hands dirty, and start exploring indigenous and wild foods. You know, as we begin, I want to start focusing on the different biomes. And the first one we're going to start focusing on is the flame-based biome. And through the flame boss biome, I want to start exploring the different types of ecosystems that form part of this biome. And one of them is Strandfell Foods. The composition of the Strandfell soil is a mix of alkaline and calcareous soil on ancient limestone. What makes this very, very unique, you know, amongst this uh, alkaline and calcareous soil, the you know, limestones tend to generally peak out, which gives you those beautiful beach cliffs. Within the Strandfeld ecosystem, it's prominently dominant by succulent species, um, but other species such as roots, tubers, flowers, and also edible grasses can be found, including your marine and aquatic edibles. It's important that obviously we embrace being within this region, the footsteps of the Khoisan, and how the Strandlopers used to forage and find their foods around this region. Edible geophytes, bochus, aromatics, flower buds, all part of this lifestyle and all part of the foods that they used to eat. You know, encompassing obviously what's happening on the land just off the coast, you know, both these ecosystems complement each other, both from the aquatic, marine, and now the Strandfeld. So generally within this region, we'll start harvesting and foraging ingredients from within these regions so that we can start preparing to give you a holistic experience of the Strandfeld. One thing you can always get to appreciate when walking through the Strandfeld is the aromas of the botanics, the florals, the colors, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, we live in a diverse ecosystem here where within this time of the year, everything has bloomed. You've got all the nectar, you've got the bees, you've got the birds, you've got all the crickets humming in the background. It's a really, really special place to be. Let's get started as we go start exploring the Strandfell foods of the famous biome. 
This is probably one herb that you'll probably smell before you find it, and it's what we call the elusive buchu. Uh, this species in particular is the licorice buchu, which is my absolute favorite. Every time I taste and smell this plant, it just takes me back to my childhood when I was a kid, and I used to walk down to the little side store and go buy those licorice sticks and eat them. It is exactly the same. Uh, brings back super memories. The one amazing factor about the buchu species is that it comes in a variety of different types of flavors. There's garlic, there's lemon, and there's the aniseed, or the honey, or the licorice buchu as I call it. This herb can be used both medicinally and both culinary, also to make a tea. With the tea, it's, in my opinion, is to take 50% dry with 50% fresh, and then brew the tea with that. Therefore, you're pulling out all those beautiful flavor notes and those terpenes from this Within cooking, desserts, a honey buchu or a licorice buchu ice cream is absolutely phenomenal. So when you're looking at Strunfeld aromatics and you know really things that can really pick up those flavor profiles, this is a great choice of plant to have. The beautiful thing about this plant is that it is, can be used both medicinal and if you have stomach problems or you need an immune booster, holistically this plant can solve a lot of problems. Um, in Cape households today, it's a traditionally used plant for many medicines where they take it, they mix it with honey, hot water, and they drink it for flu, for stomach problems, and just for general body health, which is great. I um, mean, cooking in culinary, which is lovely about this herb, is when you're cooking with it, you're actually making your customers healthy by providing them the correct nutrients within their body. As you can see, this, this plant is beautifully green, it's growing wonderfully, and it's growing within a natural ecosystem. When I look at the soil, I can see there's a lot of decomposed organic matter, and which that shows me that there's a lot of microbial activity within the soil. This is showing me I have a pure source of food. It's not laden with fertilizers, it's not laden with um, soil improvers. What you're getting from this plant is purely pure from the soil up. So we take the bottom up approach when we look at an ingredient. Look at that, it's beautiful, but I've got rock dust in here. I have got plant organic matter, I've still got decomposing matter, it's absolutely amazing. This, in my opinion, is one of the richest soils that you can find. It's probably a wild botanical that everybody knows about, is the Pelagonium or the wild mulva. Absolutely delicious herb to have as well. You know, the flavor, the scents of rose. The thing about this plant as well, that it also comes in a variety of other flavors. You, know, you get the citronella, you get the lemon, you get the peppermint, you get a nutmeg. Um, it's so, so, so diverse. But you know, even when you're looking at the plant, there's so much inspiration you draw from the different colors. But even if you just go a little bit closer, you get into those filaments of the stigmas, the stigmas themselves. an absolutely amazing treat. And when you're looking at the plant, you always got to look at all the different types of uses of it as well. You've got the petal, you've got the buds which are beautiful, you candy these for desserts, and you dip them into sugar, and so when you eat them, you just get this explosion of rose. The leaves as well, very waxy, so not very palatable, not very nice to eat, so you need to somehow infuse them into milk, into sugar syrup, um, if you're making cocktails as well, or trying to actually brew up your own gin, this is one of the botanicals that a lot of people in craft gins and craft distilleries at the moment are actually using to add that beautiful rose profile. You know, these flowers do have a bit of pigment to give you the little bit of pink that you need. Uh, but you know the additions of Skilpud Bessies or Borsalase Bessies or even your, your Dunguari or your Cape Sumac into those will give you those beautiful pink tones that you're looking for. This time of the year, the, with the rainfall that we had, I've, I've never seen the Pelagonium bloom like this, and it's just it's absolutely amazing to actually see this. Um, it just shows me there's health, there's prosperity, it creates a lot of nectar for the bees for pollination, and it's just helping the ecosystem. And you'll see abundance of them growing around, a very hardy plant. I want to show you a little trick with these guys. It's actually very, very nice. If you're making, taking like sorghum or wild grain, um, and you want to make like basically like a couscous style salad. You take this and you take the petiolas and you pull them back just to open up the floret. Inside, you get the underdeveloped petals. 
and those underdeveloped petals are extremely sweet. But also an extremely amazing flavor. I used to always look at all these different types of aromas and these smells and these fragrances when I'm in the Strandfeld um, ecosystem. And it always amazes me, you know, it changes from lemon to honey to rose. It's absolutely beautiful. Also one thing, you know, as a chef, it gives you the opportunity to actually get out of your kitchen and relax, just breathe. You know, we need times in our lives and our careers to just breathe and to take a step back, to embrace everything that we have. You just take a few moments to sit around your ecosystem here and you, you, you get inspired, you know, just to the small things of the plants. This indigenous edible dates back, you know, to early times when the strand lopers and the Khoisan used to use the strand felt as a source of food. With it being a rhizomous plant, you know, it's a water storage organ that sits underneath the ground and in spring and summer shoots and reveals itself. Um, at this time, it's very easy to identify them and the reason they call it a slim stalk is because it's a slime stick. And if you break the stick, it's like a slime inside, but you can also chew it uh, for moisture intake. So if you're lacking water or fresh water and you just want to quench your thirst, you chew on the, the stem. The top of the buds over here, the flowers, and then obviously the seed pods are all edible parts, uh, which are quite nice. You cook them like peas. But it's very simple. It's a very shallow um, bulb. And you just loosen around it. Just really gently around it. You don't want to bruise the bulb. And eventually she's going to get up. Okay. Then you get a little bulb. So. This pulp has a flavor like to turnip and, and onion, and it can be used as a replacement for onion. They do get a lot bigger than this, um, but it's very beautiful, and it's a lovely snack. They can be eaten raw or cooked. What I like to do, I like to soak it into a little bit of water, um, just to get rid of some of that mucus sap within the roots as well. Um, but, you know, slow cooking really does the job. The Mars Samphire grows on muddy, sandy flats, um, generally in estuaries, um, outside river mouse, uh, by salt water surfaces. It's actually a very delicious thing to eat, you know, it's like a salty stick and you can actually break them between all the different types of internodes and use it as a snack in a salad and catch it fresh, fresh, um, pan fry that and this is a very great accompaniment if you're picking mussels off the rocks. Samphire is a succulent that's part of the parsley family and it grows in salty marshes and estuaries. Um, in the old days um, it used to be referred to as glasswort because it used to be dried and ground into a powder to make um, glass, believe it or not. A very important thing about obviously samphire is the fact that it needs to come from a clean water source. All these plants being succulents, whatever the nutrients is within the water is going to get sucked up into your food. So it's always best to get out to the city, get away from coastal resorts and polluted estuaries as well um, to go and actually harvest these. You know, you'll, you'll notice that the flavor of the marsh samphire versus the, the, the rock samphire, the rock samphire is a lot saltier than this, but this is a lot more juicier than obviously the rock samphire. And if you look at harvesting per yield, the marsh samphire is in abundance and there's a lot more you can harvest from here than you can from obviously the, the rock samphire. By the end of the day, they're both useful plants and both edible and absolutely delicious. Those that live in the Cape will be very familiar with this plant and something that's called a confetti bush. Other name for it is a broombochu, and the reason they got that name for broombochu because the leaves used to be broken off and then used as a broom to sweep the floors. This is a fisherman's best friend because after a day of fishing, your hands get very smelly and full of fish. And it's a great plant to be able to take, take the leaves and rub them in your hand to get rid of those horrible smells from the fish. But in this species of confetti bush, some with fine, some with white flowers. 
and some would find some with pink flowers. Very similar um, smells and flavor profiles, um, but this plant itself is very high in essential oils. So there's a lot of great uses, both medicinal and also to create an invigorating bath. When you soak a hot water bath, and you soak some leaves inside the bath and you have a bath, it really soothes your body. Um, very relaxing kind of herb. That being said as well, it's an old cape remedy for colds and flus. And also the leaves used to be chewed to relieve sore throats. Cooking to me, this is a great replacement for time in the kitchen um, because it's a great complement towards game, seafood and poultry. Also using this into sauces as well, it creates a dynamic flavor profile of sweetness and citrus, um, something very unique. The plant itself is also a deodorizer. And if you're in the bush for a couple of days, which I'm sure most of you won't be, but to just say you're hiking and um, you need a deodorizer, you just break up a twig, put it underneath your arms, squeeze and pull. Works like a charm. The thing about this plant is the flowers are edible, the leaves can be brewed into a tea as well, can be dried, used just like dried thyme, and can also be used fresh. Uh, because of its high essential oil content, there's a lot of flavor from this, so use it sparingly. Um, the quantity required using normal commercial thyme versus using a confetti bush, you know, you're gonna be using half the amount. So really, really great aromatic herb to have it in your kitchen. plant generally flowers in spring, summer and autumn. Um, it's a lovely biopollinator for bees and insects. Um, it's got high nectar, uh, so if you come and have these flowers here, they're very sweet. You can pick your nose off them, sugaring up, put it within your dessert, absolutely stunning. called the Cape Sumac, also known as the Cape Tannenbush. And the reason it's called the Cape Tannenbush is because both the leaves and the bark were used for tanning hides and were also used for tanning fishing nets. The way they used to do it, they used to take the leaves, which used to tan a light brown, and used to bruise the leaves and then pack it on top of each other and then weigh it down with a slate rock. Um, leave that for about two weeks and then it would lightly tan it brown. With the bark, they'd do the similar process with that as well, and that would come out a dark brown. But over and above that, on this tree, you get these beautiful berries. This used to be a very important food source for the Khoisan, as they used to remove the pup and then press the fruit to be eaten at a later stage. Um, that being said, you know, when you compress these fruits, those sugars develop, those sugars get to settle, and it actually becomes very, very, very delicious the longer you keep it. So a lovely snack. This berry works very well with going into cordials, also making vinegars from it as well, and also making jams. In my opinion, it's one of the forgotten crops of the Cape Strandfeld foods, and a lot of people should be using this more. This plant is a survivor, and it's built accustomed to this ecosystem. Um, all the fruits, they don't ripen all at once, so it allows the, the blooming of the fruit to last as a longer period, as opposed to all ripening at once, dropping, going to seed, and then obviously um, germinating new plants. So this is dropping throughout the, throughout the year. That being said as well, the plant itself is also a parasitic plant. So if it doesn't get enough nutrient uptake from the soil, it'll start being a parasite and start drawing nutrients and attaching itself to surrounding plants. Generally, if growing around within those plants, within the species, would obviously be the confetti bushes. You'll find the buchos, um, and then also you'll be also looking for your falcons and stuff. So one of the best ways to identify a Cape Sumac, firstly, you'll notice that all the berries don't ripen at the same time. So there'll be green berries, there'll be red berries, and there'll be purple to black berries. Um, when the berries get to the dark shade, with the purple and black, then they're ready for picking. Um, it's just one thing to remember. You need to also look at the berry itself. So the difference between a Duinguari and a Cape Sumac berry. A Duinguari is round, a Cape Sumac berry is elongated and ellipsed. So you'll notice those differences. Also with a Dunguari, they all ripen at the same time, they all drop at the same time. With a Cape Sumac, 
They all ripen at different stages and they all propagate at different stages. Okay, so this is a Cape sugarbush, or known as the common sugarbush. And it's a plant that has very, very, very high nectar. You know, when you look inside the sugarbush, you usually see a lot of ants, you see a lot of insects. And what they used to do in the old days, they used to create some form of a bucket and they used to tilt the flower upside down and allow the sap to drip within the bucket. The lovely thing with that sap is that all the ants get inside it and they ant release some acid and it gives that syrup such a beautiful sour tang, if you want to call it that. One thing you always seem to find around these plants is the sugar bird uh, because it always likes to get its long beak inside there and draw all that nectar out. For those that are also looking for sugar supplements, if you've got this growing in your garden, it's a great thing. Tap the, the, the nectar obviously in season and this, the best time to do this is obviously in spring. Um, it's when the birds are out, the bees are out, the bees are looking for all the pollen so they can start producing honey. But this is a favourite for Cape honeybees. I'm on the coast today and um, recently I showed you the marshland fire, um, which is a very low growing plant and uh, growing on the marshlands. And this is the rock sand fire. You know, it grows within the crevices just by the shoreline and it gets a sea spray all the time. But you can see it's a completely different uh, plant structure to the previous uh, sandflower that I showed you um, with a low bush canopy structure. With the hard wind you'll see that it's obviously not green everywhere and you know that's why I was saying if you're looking at harvesting you know marsh sandflower or salicornia species it's the best to get onto the marsh runs and do that there. This rock samphire, in my opinion, is a lot more salty than the marsh samphire. And the reason being is it's in constant spray of salt the whole entire time. Um, on a good day, if you can get here when it's dry, you can actually see salt actually dried up on these as well. Uh, but it's still edible, it's still a snack. And absolutely delicious. You know, especially like I said previously, if you're foraging your hair, if you're foraging your hair looking for some mussels, every little palamon, an urchin, you know, it's a great company for it as well. A beautiful coastal salad. Our rock sand fire in South Africa is completely different to the rock sand fire that they get up in Australia and up in Europe and obviously up the west coast of the United States. And the reason I say that as well is that you'll see the differences in the bush structure. You know, the marsh sand fire that I showed you previously was grown as a long canopy like a runner plant. You know, this one being a low sharp canopy and it just shows you the differences and obviously this growing within the rocks as growing within the marsh. And these are part of the Salicornia species, uh, which is part of the parsley family, and you know it's a beautiful succulent, very nutritious. So we spent a lot of time obviously looking at some plants now, and I wanted to bring you down onto the rocks so to show you obviously something that's um, endemic to obviously the Cape Coast. And it's actually something that's actually a very prized pressure. This is what they call the Cape Sea Urchin. And within the sea urchin family, there's about 950 species, but there's only 18 that are actually edible. Um, when you're looking over here at the Atlantic Ocean as well, you know, this is one species that is actually edible. And then further north, you get the green one. Um, ways to identify it is obviously through the color as well. It's got a beautiful pink hue to it. With all edible species of um, urchin, there's always one thing to always look at. Look what's on the shell. If it has algae on the shell, if it has shells attached to the shell, those are generally good key indicators that this is edible. Um, obviously, with only 18 species of 950 being edible, it's always good to do your research before obviously going there. Most important thing about picking any shellfish off the rocks or any aquatic edibles is to have your permits in place. You know, these can be purchased from your post office. They are not expensive and they limit you and they guide you on the harvesting of obviously the size, the quotas that you're actually allowed to take. So just to give you a bit of an overview of what this is, you know, the, the shell of the urchin is called the test. And then you turn it upside, upside down and you get the mouth. The mouth is referred to Aristotle's lantern. And this is what is used to grind all the, the kelp and the food. Now this one in particular is actually still eating at the moment and chewing on kelp. But the thing about these species of urchins, you know, 
once their food source has been depleted, you know, they go into a mode what they call starve. And by meaning starve, it means that they can live for many years without a food source. Um, but with that being said, with inside what's happening here is what the prize thing that everybody wants to eat, which is called the gonads, believe it or not. So when harvesting urchin, the best time is to always harvest them before they start spawning. You know, once they start spawning, the, the gonads or the row with inside becomes very granular and very firm. So if you're looking for that butter, beautiful, delicious, custard-like um, umi, got to get them in the right season. A bit of ecological importance with these urchins as well. You know, every single bit of shellfish, mollusk, kelp, you know, anything in this ecosystem has an important role. And if one of those items is removed out of that ecosystem, a complete imbalance happens. So what happened in the early 90s, there was an overpopulation of actually sea urchin along the beach, and nobody could understand why. Then in 1994, they all just disappeared. Further studies showed that there was an increase in lobsters, and the lobsters actually started eating these. The ecological importance, obviously, of the urchin is to protect the baby palamon from predators. And if these are gone, all the baby palamon get eaten, and then that causes the imbalance with the abalone species. So it's always to remember when we're doing something, everything in nature, you know, needs to be in balance. And we need to be part of that balance. So we need to work with nature. And that's why this quote is in place. That's why the size regulation is in place, because our studies have already been conducted on what we can and what we cannot catch and how many we can catch. One very important thing to always remember when you're foraging on the beach is never ever turn your back on the coast. The waves, the sea is so unpredictable and when you come in here you need to respect. So everything you do within here you have to have respect to the sea, respect to the land. So what a lot of people don't know is that if you know where to look and look within the right places, you can actually find condiments of the ancestors. And what I'm looking at now, I'm actually looking at a salt pan where there's actually salt crystals that are actually growing from the sea spray. So what happens is the water actually settles within these pools and as the heat breaks down on them, you know, it evaporates all the water and you get left with all these beautiful salt crystals. Now this used to become a prize bartering um, ingredient back in the days with the Khoisan because salt was used to preserve the fruits, it was used to flavour the fruits and it was also used to trade for butter, fats, oils and anything else that they needed to survive. Especially within this region there is actually an endangered salt pan at the moment, it's called the Vermont salt pan and its conservation is threatened at the moment with urbanisation and development and there's lack of funding, there's lack of support, and there's lack of knowledge of that. So one thing that if anybody can always do is when you go to all these coastal towns for holidays, support your conservation places, support your ecotourism, support your parks, 